The reason why I didn't make the NFL was because I was throwing regulation footballs. What I should have done was just take a little bit of air out of it, and it just magically drops in there. In rock and roll, when you sell out Madison Square Garden, the L.A. Forum, Red Rocks Amphitheater, Royal Albert Hall, and sell 35,000 tickets at Fenway Park, you know you've made it. Everybody knows you made it. I mean, that's huge. Now, I've experienced playing at all those venues, except for Fenway, with John Mellencamp, Bob Seger, Smashing Pumpkins, Joe Cocker, and John Fogarty, to name a few. But this guy, my guest tonight, did this by himself, alone on stage with no band, <laughs> just a friggin' microphone. A friggin' microphone. Are you kidding me? He doesn't know yet, but I, I'm going to start a band with him, kind of like the White Stripes, except he plays drums. I hate these guys. They, they do everything better than anybody. All right, seriously, this, this guy's been nominated for both a Grammy and an Emmy, has released seven comedy specials, has appeared in multiple major movies and TV shows, and he created F is for Family, a critically acclaimed Netflix original show which aired for five seasons. All right, say hi to badass, bald and beautiful, Bill Burr. How are you? Sorry. Co-created, co-created F is for Family with Mike Price. Oh, co-created. With the great Mike Price from The Simpsons. Oh, that's cool, you. Yeah. Hey, I bet you never sold out the Red Line Inn, 50 people. Where is that? I Stockbridge. probably worked there. Stockbridge. Stockbridge? Where I grew up. Is that you know, Connecticut? Exit to Massachusetts. Oh, it's oh. A, it's a famous hotel, like right in that little town. I thought, with, I thought Lee, Massachusetts is exit too. It is, but yeah, I mean, you get off at Sturbridge, Lee. you mean? No, Stockbridge. Sturbridge is exit 11. We've been, we've both been doing this a long time. I know. <laughs> you, literally, you know, they change. You're naming like exits. So I'm like, oh yeah, yeah. They got that little, that little fucking shit pie place there. <laughs> yeah. I had a dinner roll thrown at me. Yeah. Howard Johnson. And Lee. Uh, don't you miss the Howard Johnson Motor Lodge? Like they had the restaurant. And they had the whole place where you could stay. That was like a badass I know. time. That was when you loaded up the Woody with the family. Yeah. And the whole thing was there. And you had the big, the big hotel pool. And then you'd go down there for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And that was, uh, that was, his life was, well, I don't know, simple. 25 bucks a night, I think those, ho 21 bucks a night. I, when I was trying to find in my first apartment in New York, I used to go to that payphone in Times Square that was right next. Remember the Howard Johnson yeah. in Times Square? Yeah. I was right outside there. I have no idea where that is now. That's probably like MTV now or whatever. Oh, yeah. It's, well, everything's changed down there. Yeah. They cleaned it up. Listen, when I go on tour now, I don't even go out of the hotel. When all this crazy stuff went down, you know, I just, you know, I'll stay at a hotel. I'll get the room service or I'll call up, you know, the, the delivery. But I, I... You grew up. I mean, that's the, one of the best things. Doing the gig and going right back to the hotel, you fight it. At first, going like, oh, no, 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 I'm going to miss out. I'm going to miss out. And then you just like, you literally, you go. But once you get back to you, like, wait, this is great. I'm sober. I'm going to get eight hours sleep. Yeah. Going to order a little room service. Yeah. Put on some Netflix. It's, it's so much better. I, I very wise comedian told me that one time. So you're, you're totally in the sports thing. So, the, you know, the Boston, I mean, you were like Bruins, Red Sox, you know. Still am. Celtics. Yeah, still am. I was mainly uh, growing up. I was Patriots and Bruins. And that, oh, I've dunked back then, though, didn't they? Uh, we would, oh, we would, it was like a cardiogram. Like we would, you know, we would all, you know, we'd be like two and 14, and then we'd be four, you know, we would be 11 and five, yeah. then have like an eight and eight, seven and nine, da da da. da and then we'd, we'd have like a, you know, we were definitely, we were more of a wild card team, but it was like uh, we were dealing with, with uh, Bob Greasy. Oh, yeah. The Dolphins just kept your, That was the Dolphins. Bob Greasy and then Don Strzok and David Woodley even got them to the Super Bowl. And then Dan Marino came in, and that was a wrap. Yeah. And then... Uh, but they never won the Super Bowl. That year, they I know, went and 17 that, to nothing. They never won. What do you mean? I don't no, no, they, they won 17 to 0 and won it. Did they, they win my the, team, my team went 18 and 0 and then lost to the Giants. Oh. We went 18 and 1. We were the ones that was choked that it Was that the one where uh, Manning threw that crazy falling... Yeah. The helmet, the helmet catch. But I got to tell you something, dude. This is how much I love sports. I fucking love Eli Manning. And as we're, much we're sure. as I hate that he beat us twice, I also love that as part of his legend because, like, as much as I, you know, root for my teams and everything, I don't root against greatness. Of course and not. that guy, yeah. like, to, okay, you do it once. Uh, maybe yeah. he got lucky. We could have maybe yeah. not dropped that in a second. But he did it twice. 
And at that point, you got to be like this guy. Like I felt with him, it was like he almost in a way like played to the competition. Like he had his shit games like during the season. Yeah. When they would play, like I would think he so it almost get like lulled to sleep. But like as you know, November, December, like that guy was just on. And then when he went in the playoffs, like it, time to be on, man. Yeah, if you beat him, you really had to beat him. He he was um, that guy. I think definitely should be in the Hall of Fame. Well, I mean, that's what made Brady's. I mean, he just showed you every single time. You let that guy have three minutes, and they're down fourteen or even twenty-one points against Atlanta once. They come. I mean, it's like watch. Here he goes. He's going to tell you. They're going to tell you. Everybody knows, and he does it. Yeah. I mean, come on, Atlanta kind of fucked up taking they did they took that sack and it was like, but that was the thing like he also made you pay yeah and belichick made you pay yeah. if you fucked up they would just make you pay yeah for the mistake and they so. deflate you so that's a whole nother thing man. that they deflate i know what you're doing here yeah you know you know and that's what Are that, you, would you, did you say that by accident or are you giving me shit for deflate gate nope i'm just saying it by accident <laughs> oh that's stupid but that, that, i wish i could take credit that i was that genius but no that's what Mahomes. Oh, I thought you would be. You just literally said they deflate you. That's hilarious. Well, all the sports fans watching are dying laughing yeah, no. because of the, the, arguably the biggest trumped up charges. Good choice of words. Yeah, where well, they're just like going like, oh yeah, they, they their football's way less. That's why they won by yeah. thirty five. Oh, is that what it was? <laughs> yeah, but I thought it was you guys got your ass kicked. <laughs> Evidently, <laughs> Evidently, that's the thing. If the ball just weighs just this much lighter. It goes. The reason why I didn't make the NFL was because I was throwing regulation footballs. What I should have done was just take a little bit of air out of it, and it just magically drops in there. It's brilliant, though. I, I never really thought spilt of that. that all over. Yeah. Me. I mean, I mean, you must love if you because I, I I agree with you. If you're a fan, you're a fan. Of, Am a I this man. age now where I go to get a drink and I just I do have an old man sweater on? No, they're great. Man. Just that water I spilt on me is enough to give me pneumonia at my age. <laughs> I'm starting to feel a chill. Get a doc in here. Yeah. So did you did you like the uh, uh, Mahomes and Reed uh, winning that game? That oh, the Super Bowl? Game? I thought it was a great game. And I got to be honest, like, I really, uh, after that unreal run, it's, it, you know, I want my team to be good, good again. But it's also, in a way, is kind of nice to uh, take a few years off from the playoffs because you die a thousand deaths. Even if you don't make it to the Super Bowl, it's just like there's only one fan base that's going to end happy. And like to people that don't make the playoffs, you're disappointed. But then you get the excitement of watching the playoffs. Yeah. And you don't give a fuck because yeah. your team isn't in it. Yeah. So it's kind of nice to take that mental break because when your team makes the playoffs, you're like, like oh, pressure, oh, pressure. You die like like I, 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 I literally hate how much I care. And like, and how angry I used to get. I just can't, I, and, you know, I got my, my beautiful kids at home. and I just can't do it anymore. So I can't, I have to like, make sure that I don't care as much as, uh, as I used to. So I've tried to get into other sports, but even then, like, you know, I got into like racing, you know, for a little while, F1 and, um, MotoGP. I, I love them. I'm going to go to a race this oh, year wow. and I really get into rooting for teams and, and it just started all over again. It's like, oh, that's the Tom Brady guy. That's, that's the Peyton Manning guy. It's just, it all, well, you're a fighter. Thing. You're, you're, you're a competitive guy. And that's how you, that's how people become successful. You, you're a fighter. You, if you just didn't care, you wouldn't have a career. You know what I mean? Yeah. What you are. Yeah. You're but I, I should shut it off every once in a while. Well, when man. I'm watching motorcycles go around a track, I shouldn't be watching like I'm watching the Patriots versus the Colts. <laughs> like you're on the, the motorcycle. Well, I started, I always, and I always root for the underdog. Oh. Uh. So I would root for Davizioso against Mark Marquez, and then I would root for uh, the Red Bull team against the great, great, obviously the greatest driver ever, Lewis Hamilton. So I was always, it just felt cheesy to me to get into a sport and immediately be rooting for the guy that always wins. You know, I like the best guy. Like, so that's how I became an LSU fan because Alabama was always oh, winning. Yeah. So I couldn't just be like, and I loved Alabama with Bear, Bear Bryant when I was a kid, but I didn't watch college football for a while. And I was just like, so what am I, I'm just going to fucking root for root these for the, guys. They're you know? going to win every time. Yeah. 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 That's like people over in Europe. They like default pick like the, the Yankees and Lakers because of their success. And over here we just go, oh, I'm a Man United fan because they used to win all the time. Yeah. And it was, it was um, I don't know, you know I boring just, to me. Did you see that uh, Netflix special on uh, Michael Jordan? Yeah. I had no, you know what? I knew they were tough, but I didn't realize how mean Detroit was. I mean, Detroit. Well, that's, would, a, that's one way of putting them. 
<laughs> dirty was another. <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> but the coach would say, basically, you know, fuck them up. They basically played 1970s Raider football yeah. on the basketball court. Yeah, you would leave your feet, and uh, you had to know where Lambeer was. Like, Mahorn, well, I didn't feel was dirty. Rodman. I, Mah Mah but Rodman, Rodman was a genius. Rodman was, Rodman frustrated you. Mahorn was just a tough motherfucker, yeah. and Lambeer was dirty. Yeah. Lambeer would wait for yeah. you to leave the table, and he would just take you out. But, like, all these years later, I don't hate Lambeer anymore. He's, like, funny because, like, they... You know, they always bring up that moment when they didn't shake the bull's hands. Oh, yeah. And they walked off. Yeah. And they asked yeah. Lambeer, <laughs> they said, Do you, does that bother you that you didn't? He was like, no, fuck those guys. He goes, when we were winning it, they said we weren't champions. Fuck them. And I was just like, <laughs> I 100% respect that. Yeah. And he also, Lambeer had this shot at the top of the key, man. And it was, it, it was if he took it, it was going in. If yeah. he got to his spot. Yeah. It was, and he just had his hands would go up and he yeah. flicked his wrist and the fucking it, thing went in 90%. It was like he was taking a foul shot, even if you were guarding him. And he, uh, you know, so he had, you know, yeah. as dirty as he was. He could back he could it play. up. He, he could play. He could play. Well, you know, that was the thing I also, you know, I was, oh, Isaiah, Isaiah Thomas, nice, smiley, nice, good looking guy. He was a mean son of a gun too, man. Yeah. If you on that team. I like all of those guys now. John Sally. I love yeah. all of those guys. Uh, Joe Dumars. And then like before... We even got back into it with the Lakers again. We had those that great rivalry with those early 80s Sixers, and I hated them. Yeah. I hated them, and now I go back. One of my favorite teams of all time is the 1983 Philadelphia 76ers, who if in, my, in a perfect world, yeah. I'd put them up against the 96 Bulls or I'd say the maybe 87 or 85 Lakers, 86 Celtics, and just really try to, like, yes. if you could do that to see who would be the, uh, who would be the best, you know? I once played the garden, uh, the old garden, and uh, it was when, and, and well, there they were. They looked like they were standing, but like in the 12th row was Larry Bird, Parrish, and uh, Mikel. Yeah. And they came back and saw us. I mean, I was like. <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah, they came back. I mean, to me, it was like, I felt like a little kid in like overalls. You know, we just sold out, you know, 18, 20,000 people going nuts. But those guys were studs. What was it like the first time you played one of those big arenas? Just hearing your drums mic'd up in that. Well, the first time was uh, when I opened up. I just got the first tour I did with Mellencamp. We were opening up for the Kinks in, a, in an arena. And I mean, I was scared shitless. I mean. How like, great are they? I saw them live. They came to my college. Amazing. They came to my college. It was funny. Like, nobody believed that it was them. None? Oh, well, they, thought, they thought it was just some cover some band. Some cover band. Yeah. Because we were just like, we, everyone commuted to the school. So everyone fucking left. And I saw them with like. <laughs> Two, three hundred people. And they still, dude, they acted like it was two, three hundred thousand people. I'll never forget that. Like yeah. when I saw them, um, those things stay with you and you don't realize that Especially at the beginning when you Well, that they give you these little show business lessons without even telling you you if your if your ears and eyes are open, you you absorb yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you just kind of like remember like oh, that's how it's done. Like they why you know, they obviously wanted a bigger crowd and wished it was, it was just the promoter fucked up, whoever promoted Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, but they went out there and they didn't punish the people that showed up, man. They came out yeah. and gave us a show and I, and I was like, uh, I was all in, I got really inspired by that. It was awesome. You know, those, those brothers, they don't even talk to each other. They wouldn't, like, we were told. Ray and Dave, right? Dave and Ray and Dave. And... <laughs> they would like if one guy had his bodyguard and he'd be walking down the hall we heard that they'd say uh ray's coming down and they would stay away they wouldn't even talk to each other they just they could make money playing together isn't that crazy well those were the days before when men wouldn't go to therapy didn't talk about your feelings and just stuff just went down like when i was growing up shit went down like that when i was a kid i, that, I got into stuff like any fucking amount of energy yeah that that takes because you don't get rid of it well to just sit there like i'm not i'm not talking to kenny fuck this shit but you know he's my drummer and i'm whatever the yeah. base i'm not you know i'll fucking deal with this because i got a mortgage and just like at some point you got to be like dude what are we doing right we don't have real jobs we have fun yeah. we have fun and we get paid we're going to turn it into uh you know what's funny is that happens a lot in uh in radio too where uh you know when i was coming up there was a lot of those you know, 
two man teams, you know, those morning radio yeah. back when like morning radio was like, was yeah, it Brian and Tom and, yeah, and it was blah, how blah, you blah, sold blah, blah. tickets. Like those guys were star makers. Yeah. And like, so I used to like, I really understood that watching, you know, WBCN in Boston, we used to break bands yeah. by playing their songs. Yeah, so, that, and then they started then. like breaking comedians. So going around, it was like, you started to, uh, once I got like a little more experience, you could, you know what it was? It was the commercial break. That's when you knew. Cause when the mics were on, Hey, da, 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 yeah. and then in the commercial oh. breaks, like That's they don't like, it was a weird thing where like they talk to you, but not to each other. And after a while, and after it was like, oh, maybe they were just interested in me. And then two commercial breaks in the treatment. It's like, oh, these guys aren't talking. Yeah, they aren't talking. <laughs> they don't, their heads go down. It's like they're even doing their heads. Yep. Yeah. And then they do the picture and they both stand on either side. Dude. And then, yeah, dude. Yeah. Dude. Yeah. Dude. Yeah. dude, what was it like? I mean, you know, you grow up. I want to say the Morgan house, that was that lead. That's, I was trying, I remember, that's where you did that funny, the worst experience of your life, you know, comedy in Lee. Remember you told me that's on the podcast? The horrible, that was the Morgan house. I couldn't remember. On oh, the is that what it was? Oh, okay. It was called the Morgan house. And um, I'm thinking from Morgan house to Fenway. I mean, you know what I'm saying? I mean, it's like. Yeah, I and I had to What's that sure. like? Fenway, I mean. I didn't even get a chance to really take that in. I'll be honest with you. I just, it was so like, you know, overwhelming that it's I. It's insane. That I've I, been in that green monster. They call it the green monster. Right? Yeah. So I, I didn't think about it. I just. I just prepared like I was doing like a set. And I also, uh, you know, I'd gone back there like a week before and I was kind of walking around town. You know, I was staying in Boston. I was walking around town and like I was running into people and they were super like really nice. Just going like, hey, they, hey, you know, hey, Billy Redface. Hey, good luck on, you know, yeah. whatever the That's Saturday. Boston for you, yeah. But they were like, they, I could, and I could feel like they were rooting for me. Yeah. And I would be like, yeah, man, I better be funny on that one. That helps. They, and they would like laugh, but it, I, it made me feel like people were happy that I, I had come back. They were happy that I, I was doing something. And um, you were one of theirs. So yeah, they yeah, embraced. yeah. So you know that. Think about it, talking about sports. Thriller from Manila. That's that was a big thing. That Muhammad Ali was hanging with the people. Yeah, you remember? Did you see that? that yeah, that's that? how. Yeah, that's how he got the crowd. That's how he got the crowd. Yeah, and they, they didn't give a crap about Foreman. And you know, when you got all those people rooting for you, it makes a difference. Yeah, it it it, it kind of like lifts you up. So I kind of did the gig. And what was funny was literally the day after I had to go right to Toronto, you know, agents, you know, just keep more. So I didn't even get a chance to even like take it in. But I will say that like, uh, it could not have gone any better. And um I was hanging out afterward. They they let us smoke cigars and stuff. We were up in the, that area in right field. And I was standing up there with Tony V, who I started out with. And he was on the show with me. And we were smoking cigars and people were walking out just like, hey, you know, great show. Like, and it was just like, I felt like it was, um, it was like the end of a movie. And, um, but like I said, it went by so fast. But I will never forget after like 10 minutes in, when I realized it wasn't going to be a bunch of drunk people yelling at me that they were actually came there to see comedy. And it was like, almost like the perfect night for baseball that I was, and the sound was great. And how close was the audience to you? Did they build seats right up to you? Oh yeah. They were like, they, so they, where were you on the field? I was in center field. Oh, okay. Sort of in left, which way you look sort of left center, dude, I was looking straight towards, the, I had like Fred Lynn spot. I was looking straight to home plate. And that's why that's oh. why I just kept looking up. I just kept seeing Fenway Park written above yeah. where they announced the game and then just seeing it just going and just they they didn't have the infield because they protect that, but yeah. it went out like that and then just went into the stands and just kept going up and kept going back. And it was like uh it reminded me of uh Led Zeppelin, that song The Ocean. Yeah. They were singing about their crowd because they used to draw such big crowds, yeah. it was like an ocean. And um of course they grew drew ten times um, the Fenway gig, but like, yeah. I got a little feeling of that. It was like, it just kept going. Wow. And I have a couple of really cool pictures. I'll show them to you sometime. Um, I'm on the, uh, the wall in my office, like over in a corner and every once in a while I'm cleaning up and I'll kind of look at it and it kind of brings me back for a second. I kind of get like that little bit of a wow. rush, like, wow. It's like you just, yeah, I know what it is, man. You just keep moving. You keep moving. You keep moving. You don't have time. You'll think about that when you're 85 and you'll go back and have things to think about. But Sometimes you just. No, no, I, I definitely, that was more like my tour schedule. 
and that it just kind of kept going. And yeah. where I would have liked to have maybe stayed an extra day in Boston, walked around and took a little victory lap. Yeah. Of like, oh, now I can actually- Enjoy Boston. Yes. <laughs> Cause I was enjoying Boston, but it was, they had this thing like yeah. tapping me on the shoulder the whole time. So, um, yeah, I mean, and I could never in a million years explain why or how that happened. It's just, or why it happened to me or whatever. Cause there's so many, um, incredibly, uh, talented, funny people out there, but do they bands, everything like why that, ha I have no idea why that happened, but I've learned to not question it. Just do it. Yeah. Be thankful that it happened. Yeah. And then, you know, don't be I an mean, asshole. Did, I didn't even know they do events uh, at that stadium. In a way, we have like the Yankees to thank and George Steinbrenner because the way he was spending money and the way he was buying up free agents and everything and baseball wasn't stopping them, that we had to become them, which we did, you know, for a long, long time, you know, just buying up for, we, you know, there was that, that 2007 team and that was essentially the way the Yankees did it. So they needed to generate money money make more income yeah big building so they 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 rather um because my whole time growing up i don't remember anybody bands or anybody playing, playing at fenway right yeah and now all of a sudden then it was just like paul mccartney's playing and all yeah. these, these legendary yeah. people and then it became like bands from now we're doing it and stuff and uh yeah you're making money you're paying you're using the, you got this venue make money yes and then then we could compete yeah with uh with with New York and and get the monkey off our back and finally fucking win one. Oh, dude, crazy. I'll never, I'll never, I know exactly where I was. And I actually did Bronson and Royo's record, and he won the sixth game, the pitcher, for the Red Sox. And and uh, but I remember when that whole thing went down. It's like, I mean, they were like one out from being out, and then they came back and just just took it. Yeah, it was. The, it's like they they did the just Hollywood they, movie. Yeah, totally version of it. And that one's and like. That was the, uh, that's all I ever wanted as a Red Sox fan because, you know, the Yankees had 26, now they got 27. It's like, there's no way to catch yeah. to ca with like 32 teams. And um, it's just not, you know, there's always that one team that kind of takes off, which is what's amazing about what the Lakers have done because they seamlessly went from um, when you had to build a team yeah. to the free agent era, and they took advantage of the fact that they were out here in Hollywood, beautiful weather, beautiful women. It was easy to get people to, to entice, yeah. And that's funny, because they sit there and they go, well, Boston's cold and it's racist and blah, blah. Like, they always try to like yeah. glaze over the racism yeah. out here. Yeah. Like, they always try to act like, oh, racism in Boston, it's <laughs> in the South. It's just like, oh yeah, Watts riots. Rodney King, every time the Lakers win a championship, all of a sudden non-white people are tipping over cars, light, police cars, lighting them on fire. What is that an expression of how fucking happy they are out here? Dude, Philly's the worst. Dude, we every, used to can, I, can I tell you something? Every place is the worst. Oh, okay. Every place is the yeah, fucking but, worst. But I like, swear. there's so much, like, um, I don't know how to fix it. There's no way no, well, to no. fix it because it's just, it. you know what it really keeps us separate is just like, this whole thing of like, like how capitalism and consumption works, where it's like, we're all just running on this wheel. And if you fall down and I stop to pick you up, you, I get you trampled. Get, you get trampled. I get trampled. Yeah, that's where they want it. So it just keeps you. Yeah, and I think that that's why the pandemic in a lot of ways where everyone had to uh, quarantine became this great thing. And, and so many people started thinking about their existence yeah. and running on this wheel and yeah. going into this fucking office the way that they were treated. And, you know, they're trying to spin it now. All these young kids, they don't want to work and blah, blah, blah. It's the classic thing. Always, the abusers always blame oh, yeah. the abuser. Yeah. Oh, they want to work. Oh, they're <laughs> fucking lazy. Like, well, you know, maybe if you weren't treating them like shit. That's a good point. And yeah. firing people and then going, now you have to do two jobs so I can get even more of a bonus because that's kind of like, how it works, it's like, I just had a friend of mine, uh, you know, get laid off that's in, you know, not in this business. And, you know, this guy, like, when he first started there, had like a crew of three people helping him do his job. And during that time, they gradually got rid of all three. And then they started giving him shit about him not producing. And he was like, well, I used to have three people helping me. Yeah. And they were just like, well, you know, figure you it. got to do it. Figure it out. Yeah. Like, just. Yeah. Just heartless. Yeah. And, um. 
I don't know how this ends, but I don't think it ends well. We'll be dead and gone, I have a feeling. I think it's a little closer than that because I, I feel like as much as people shit on social media and stuff, there is there there's a lot of like good things about it that give regular people uh yeah. power to communicate, to create things and stuff like and music stuff business. like that. Yeah. I could never get a record. You couldn't get your anything heard. So the good news is anybody can be heard because you can just put it out there. The only thing is the down not the downfall, but you're competing against everybody in the world. So anybody can yeah, come but, you know, I, I, you know, I still maintain you know, that if you're the real deal yeah. and you stay positive yeah. and you're not an asshole, because yeah. that's the big thing. And that's like, uh, I don't know for you, but for like stand-up co comics, I feel like um, your 30s are probably the hardest. Because when you're in your 20s, there's the excitement and the hope. Like I'm doing this, blah, blah, blah. And then, and then you get into your 30s and when something hasn't happened yet, that's the critical time where you can start becoming bitter. And also uh, what a younger person does and what I did is you're, you, you don't understand how dangerous comparing is. Like, well, I started six months before you oh, yeah, and yeah. I'm here and you're there. Like that will sap all yeah, of your yeah. creative energy. Absolutely. And what you have to do is the, the um, solution to that is rooting for people being ha and making yourself do it, learning how to do it and getting out of that running on a wheel thing and just be like, hey man, like I'm doing what I'm doing. And also letting go of, especially when I came up before, when it was really the industry and you had to do a showcase and they had to go, uh, we like you, we've decided that you can maybe make it. Like they, it, was, it was up to them. So um, you had to have the confidence to be like, I don't give a fuck what they're looking for. I feel like if I do what I'm doing, eventually they're going to get me as I get an audience. Like I realized pretty quickly that like that was the road I had to go. The best you'll be is be exactly what you are. If you're trying to be something else, you're, you're just, you're not going to be a hundred percent. And I did that. I wore the shirt yeah. and I, I did the whole outfit the thing. thing. Is, the first time I was in LA, like, you know, whatever the look was, I would try to have yeah, the, yeah, oh, yeah. it's the grunge look, it's the this look. I, I did all of that and nothing. You know, my dad told me this. You know, it's funny how you remember these things because you knew that, that he was right. But when you're young, you're like, nah, nah, nah. But I, you don't understand. He was like, he just say just basically what he was saying, just focus on the end zone. Don't worry about what they're saying. But of course you worry about what everybody's saying. You're a kid. You're a little kid. You want Mike and Mary and Billy and Bob all to say, you're cool. You know, it's like your dad isn't at school with you telling you you're cool. I want them to think I'm cool. So you're like trying to, and, but he was right. But I was no, too young are, to understand. Those, those are great. Uh, that, that's, those are pieces of advice that uh, I'm holding on to for when my kids get to a certain age. Yeah. And I feel like that's going to be stuff, you know, I, I like playing catch with them because. Um, oh, you can talk. Yeah. And you have this, this activity that. Yeah. That's, is, brilliant. It, That's it, brilliant. It, it it makes stuff come down, and and I can ask my dad, hey, how'd it go to school today? Yeah, you know, it's all right. Or like, oh, it's good. You know, I can, I can really see where it's like if she has like a bad day, um, and she's just sitting there. If I was to ask, then, you know, and this is a fun, and you can just tell something's bothering her or whatever. And a lot of times, you know, she's only six, so it's like cute little things that like, you know, I thought you were going to take me for ice cream or something. But you know, my daughter said the other day, what? I took her out for ice cream. You know, we drove down the street and went down a couple of blocks and we got out of the car. Um, she goes, uh, as we got out of the car, she goes, you know, everybody who lives on this block is rich. You know why? And I said, why? She goes, because they live right next to the ice cream store. <laughs> <laughs> and there was like something really profound about that where I was just like, like what her val like that's being rich. Like yeah. if you can live, you can, if you can like anytime you want, you can just walk out. Your You're door. rich and go get some ice cream, like you're rich. And it's just one of those things. And the heartbreaking thing of raising a child is someday that innocent goes away. So innocence. So I'm trying to uh, enjoy Well, it. maybe she'll be the next Ben and Jerry's. Yeah, I know. Yeah, but then she, ice cream will become work. <laughs> <laughs> ah, fuck, I got to make that fucking <laughs> vanilla Swiss almond again. You know, my brother, is a sh twin brothers are shrinking. He told me once that he said the way he gets kids when he'd work with kids, you know, because they come in, you know, 
and they, you know, they, they, they're just frozen up. You know, he go and play, play basketball. See, let's go play or get on the floor and just play toys. And then the stuff starts coming out because now they're not fo- yep. they're, they're, they're playing exactly yep. what you said. You just, it just starts coming out. Cause I think it's natural. People like to talk about how they feel. Right. It's just natural. But if you, if you being focused on looked at like an insect and through a microscope or something, it's not going to work. Yeah. And if you're already walled off it, it, it yeah. Uh, yeah. I went through that. <laughs> hey, so one day my therapist played on me, with, you know, with toys did on the he floor. Have you play with toys? Oh, yeah, on the floor. You f- How do you like that fire engine, Billy? Oh, you like it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, then, oh my God, I don't want to know about that therapist. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> hey, come over here. Look at this toy. You know. So how did you pivot from like? Well, I I think he told me this once, but like going from the, I mean, was there a point where you're like, I'm going to be a drummer? And you know, the comedy thing, what, what came first? Drumming. I am oh, a... Uh, uh, didn't you get like I a can't kit even say with my VHS I can't even, I can't even say I'm a failed dr- musician. I, 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 one of my biggest strengths is I know what I suck at. Oh, yeah. And what happened was I started playing drums and I was like, I already felt like I was behind because I didn't start playing until I was 20. And, but what kept happening... You started at 20? Yeah, I started late. Wow. That's the latest. Yeah, because my dad played a lot of instruments, but it was kind of forced on him. So he didn't have a good experience, I don't feel. Yeah. Like they kind of, which is really sad too, because he, you know, he could play by ear and like really, really talented saxophone, piano, yeah. um, could do all of that. And so he always listened to music, but he didn't force us to do like the lessons. Like he was forced to take piano. Oh. And um, it's kind of like, it, I think it just kind of turned him off. So, I gradually, and I grew up in a jock town. Everybody played sports, which was great because I love sports. I then like I started, that. I started working in a warehouse, and I worked with these kids from Walpole. And Walpole was more, a lot, they were a lot more musicians. And like I remember the first time I saw um, one of the guys I worked with, he sat down, and he played the Doobie Brothers. Um, was it Long Train Running? And it was perfect. And I was just sitting there going like, like I thought you had to be a rock star to be able to. Yeah, so yeah. Like, no, I play. And then I was just like, holy shit. So you can play that good. Yeah. And as I, good as I started playing guitar and I just was like, this isn't for me. And then drums was sort of the, the happy medium between yeah. playing sports and oh, playing totally. and playing. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And then I got like really into listening to all of these drummers and stuff. And then I just fell in love with it. But what would happen was I'd go to the music store and there'd always be like some eight, nine year old kid would get on a kit. Yeah. And I could just, I could see what having it was. And the kid was already expressing his or her own ideas and stuff. And I was just like, I, I didn't know, I, I just didn't have that. Like, yeah. so like, I'm like a, you know, like I'm a, I'm a dad drummer, guitar center. Like, oh look at the, maybe if I get this gear, I'll sound like that guy. <laughs> like, that's basically who I am, but I have a total love and respect for it. But, um. I mean, were you at any point like practicing like four hours a day, five hours yes. a day? Yes. Yeah, you going after it. Well, anything I've ever done that I wanted to get good at, I always like, or just in general, if I'm doing something like I want to get good at it, I want to learn about it. I've had that um, thing, which I didn't realize I had that because when you go into school, you're, it's, it's that thing you're getting forced, read this book, yeah. tell me about this. Yeah, yeah. So then you get this in your head, you think, I hate reading. It's like, I don't yeah. hate reading. I just don't like what you're telling me to read. Or when to read. A when to read. Or you just don't want to be read. told anything. Yeah. Yeah. You just so, don't want to be told. Right. So that's the kind of thing that I don't know that they've ever been able to fix that. But there's a lot of like smart people that are strong willed that get a complex that they're stupid. Uh, I, I still have that. Like, I still have that thing where I think I'm an idiot because of I just have the, my report cards playing on a loop in my head. <laughs> and, and guess what? You're hardwired now that, by that. That was to call trauma i mean you, yeah when you when your brain is forming it's just way. like uh yeah and i just remember there was all these kids in like honors classes in like math team and and, and getting like you know perfect scores on the sat yeah yeah 800. and like dude i i couldn't it would take me 20 minutes to read a page like my brain was so like me too dude i wondered and i why. thought it was because i was dumb i just i just was me, well they didn't explain it to us right back then i figured if you looked at a page you 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 knew it. I'd read a whole book and wouldn't know one thing I read. I, my, because I was the same as you. My I was, 
You know, every every fucking sentence would remind me of something, and I would start thinking of that. And my <laughs> eyes would keep going. I know. And then I like I'd be like three points. What the fuck did I just read? <laughs> exactly. It was yeah. torture, dude. I, I, and when they would say like, okay, read the first pages of this, I'd have like a panic attack. I go, I can't, I can't play, you know, can't play hoop. I gotta read this. Like, ah, uh, and I'm like, oh, I'll go back. And it was just, that was awful, ever, dude. Did you ever get an ADD test? Or a, is it ADD? Yeah. They didn't have that back then. They tested me, but you know what? I think I beat it because so I'm a jock, sports competitive. I'm like, oh, I'm going to win this game. It was a uh, game to me. What it was, they didn't tell you, but they put a screen on, a, a computer screen. And it, when, as soon as a, a white rectangle came up, you go with a button. If you have ADD, is it ADD? Is that what they call it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you have ADD, they 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 not only see if you nail it, but they if you you get anxious and you start <laughs> you start you you become erratic when you hit it. All right, I only missed one because I blinked when it came on. I didn't do anything, and yeah, <laughs> I blinked right when it came on. I went, what, what, you know, and they don't tell you how long it's going to be. If you have ADD, you're going to get all uptight. The other thing is, 250 questions, multiple choice. If you have ADD, you're going to go. Hell with this. You just start feeling exactly. It. I immediately just just thought like by, by question 40, I don't give a fuck yeah. if this ruins my life. Yeah. I just want to end this exercise. Yeah. Like, Not me. A. I, yeah. C. Fuck off. D. Yeah, I'm out. Not me. I was like competitive. I'm gonna beat this thing. I think I was ADD, but the lady said, I came in and said, what, 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 what's my score? She says, get out of here. You passed. It was almost like she knew you beat the system. <laughs> right. Oh, but you think I was competitive. Right. So I might be ADD, but I was so stimulated to win that I hung in there. Right. And I beat the system, I think. Because, dude, I mean. Well, look at you. Yeah, well, you, you know. You could probably what? be a lie detector, you know? You ought to, you ought to turn into a life of crime. <laughs> you know how, you know what turned it around for me? Okay. I would have be afraid to beat that thing because I would think, in like, if I don't have ADD, then it is true. I am an idiot. I, I would want to be like, oh, man, you're off the charts, ADD. Yep. You are a fucking yeah. mess. And I'd so be yeah, like, yeah. oh, thank oh, it's you. it's not my fault. I have an excuse now. Yeah, I have an excuse. <laughs> <laughs> the thing that changed it for me is I was terrified of chemistry. In, in my house, we were all going to college, you know? And, um, you know, my dad did the last 13 missions in a bomber to take out Hitler in World War II. You know, his grandfather came from the Ukraine. They know? needed 13 missions to get that little shit? No, he, he must was have been quick. He was the last 13. <laughs> he made sure that that guy didn't come. <laughs> <laughs> but so, you know, everybody goes to college, you know, and it was like, you know, you know, so I was like, oh, my God, I'm not going to get to college. I can't. So we had chemistry and physics coming up. Chemistry, in junior year, physics, senior year. And the coach was the coach. The professor was a coach and he was a tough son of a bitch. I, he scared the hell out of me. So this is what happened. I'm like, oh, my God, chemistry, oh, my God, chemistry. Okay, I went, okay, I am not going to turn that page until I know everything on it. And I got an A- minus on my first quiz. Then the guy said, you, if you want to come over to the house, you know, you want extra help, I'll help you out. Oh, over, you could see you struggling. <laughs> yeah, I went over to his house. He had a million records and metal was his favorite. I mean, you listen to music? This wow. guy? This guy thought he was like Hitler Youth Corps or something. He was a mean son. I thought he was a mean son. I'm going, no, he was the coolest dude in the world. So I got an A in chemistry. And then I had him in physics. Got an A in physics. And then I went, oh, I learned how to study. I learned. You just don't, just because you see the page doesn't mean you know it. So I just. Well, let me ask you this. Because you always get these gigs where like all of a sudden you have to fill in for like if somebody goes down or they just like, you know, we need a guy who's a guy that we can just depend on. Let's get Kenny. And then all of a sudden you have to learn 20 years of, of, of these people's songs, some yeah. big band song. Like when you get like the drum charts, because you're no, into it. I write the drum charts. Oh, you write the drum I charts. I write every note out. Oh yeah, why am I thinking like they're gonna yeah, be drum charts? I write every single note. I could even show you it's in the next room. I write every note. I have every note written out because I have a suck memory. So I write every note out, the tempo. When I do like Kennedy Center Honors, I get the script of the show. I know who has to tune. I know where Don Henley's walking on and Loretta Lynn's going this way. I know who has to talk the teleprompter. As soon as one song's over, I've got the click on for the next tempo 
and I know how much time I have. I'm looking to see if Johnny has to tune his guitar strings. I know everything. Do you still like, do you still go like, I can't believe I'm playing with this person or at this point have you played with so many people? I play with so many people, but I still appreciate it so much. Like I just did a gig with Vince Gill, uh, Kevin Cronin from REO, uh, Stephen Stills, uh, Kenny Wayne Shepherd, and Billy Gibbons. One show, uh, two, uh, one day of rehearsal, the day of the show, Vince came in and I mean, 30 songs. And I got, and people look at me because if they get confused, those people who try to memorize, Stephen Stills is up there. He's rewriting everything while he's up there. People are like, oh my God, you know? So the drummer is the one that's going to, I lead them to chord changes. I lead them to sections. Kenny Wayne Shepard will look at me because he played with me. He's going to stop right now, you know? But mostly I have everything written out, you know? And I have an iPad right there, you know? And I've got, I just read. And, you know, I remember doing like Kings of Chaos, you know, you know, Sebastian Bach, you know, it's more of these heavy guys, uh, Sebastian Bach, uh, whoever else is there. How far ahead do you read on a chart versus what you're playing? I'm reading all of it. I'm not saying like. I read like I'm, I'm looking at it, but I like. Half a bar ahead, you were a full bar ahead. No, usually like I'll, if there's a beat, it's usually, no, nah, I shouldn't say that. Sometimes, you know, the, the parts are, first of all. Like, you're doing Led Zeppelin or something. I mean, who, who am I to change one note of what John Bonham did? Or any of these, these songs that were huge hits. I don't, if I've never rehearsed with, let's say, a singer from a famous band, I don't know if they wanted exact, that's not the way it was recorded, or if they want it to be free. And this is the one I love. Ah, eh, just do what you want. They don't mean it. They don't mean it. Right. The other thing is- I, I bet you learned that the hard way. Oh, dude. Yeah, just do whatever you want. (laughs) And then the other thing is what I'll do when I do like when I did, we were honoring Sting uh, for the Kennedy Center honors and Bruno Mars came in. I I do research. I go online, look at the, if they play that that material. A whole other level. Yeah. Whole other level. Well, he did a, a police medley. So I looked at it and I made a chart of the album version and made a chart of the way he does it. Sure enough, that's what he wanted to do. He he wanted to do his version. His arrangement of it. Yeah. Oh. So they did some different things. So I had learned. I had both ready. And that's his brother on drums, right? Oh, I don't in, know. In his band, I think. I don't know. You see, the thing with the Kenny, that's the scary, that's the Super Bowl. That's the, I see the greatest artists come in there and they're like so humble because it ain't their band, it ain't their PA, it ain't their show. Mm-hmm. They're just a guest. When I did like, you know, Zeppelin, it was like, no, the who? It's like Dave Grohl and Rob Thomas. Then uh, Chris Cornell, it's one after another. You got one song, you off, next comes on. And so I, they don't even tell us the songs until a week before. And I'm scrambling, learning off everything Keith Moon did. Then I go to the artist to see if they did, I make charts. Then you walk in the day of the, of the re- first rehearsal and I got a drum set that I tweak in the rehearsal place. And then I go to the big stage and tweak that set and I'm waiting for the musical director to come in. He's got a set of charts and he has talked to the artist and they've discussed form. And I, there's, there's no way I can write my parts on these charts. How do you even figure out, like, I've, like I sit down and play drums with every band. The Who, I've never even attempted. That's one of the hardest. I just listen and I listen how he's, like, I guess they say Entwistle so kind of tied him and, and yes. Pete. And Twistle hold the whole thing together. Yeah, he he dearly does. Did I, I watched him? Mellencamp opened up three shows, and I just stood on the stage, and I went. My whole life, all I'd watch is da- da- Daltrey, the singer, Keith Moon, who's a complete nutcase, and then you know, you know, uh, Pete jumping around. He doesn't even look at Entwistle. Meanwhile, I was standing on the side of the stage. Oh my God, he was the whole. He's the whole. He's running the whole show. He's. He's the only guy that's really do, 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 holding it down with playing eight notes or 16 notes. Two yeah. fingers. fingers, about, One finger's about that thick. <laughs> but hey, <laughs> you're right. And, and Keith Moon, every measure is different. Every, that's not what a drummer does. You're supposed to keep a beat, you know, keep it pretty close to what that beat is mm. so that you don't, you're still moving around and you're throwing everybody else off. Well, that's the thing. Like, I felt like he was, uh, he just was in the zone. And he was just kind of like, like first when I thought him, it was just like when I heard him, I was like, this guy's just soloing through the piece. 
And then, you know, your ears get more mature and you listen. It's like, oh no, there's, there's like, there's patterns here and there's a thought and there's different sections. It's just his approach was, is just so, uh, you know, <laughs> I think after a while I was just like, you know what, this is one guy I'm not going to try to figure out. I'm just going to enjoy. Yeah. Yeah. Like I watched this thing the other yeah. day, uh, this is killer interview on Elvin Jones. And it's just, it's oh, like a, wow. a different drummer. And it is a different uh, drummer. yeah. And what I loved about him and Tony, Oh God! Was uh, it, Tony's probably my favorite, even though I have no idea a lot of things that he's doing. And I actually saw him when I was just, um, but right at the end of his life. Was he with? Oh, at the end. Yep, I saw him at the Regatta Bar in, um, in uh, Massachusetts. I, I saw the, my my drum teacher was a seventy year old. This guy Frank Shushan. He used to call himself the last of the great Armenian trap drummers. And he used to take. I saw. He took me out. I saw Roy Haynes, Louis Belson. Tony Williams, I saw them all. Max Roach, and uh, Max I saw at the uh, at Berkeley, but I saw all of these guys in this little little uh, bar. And um, what I loved about Tony was, it's like he had a rock star drum kit. He had big fucking yeah. drums, and he would make these like. Do you have the yellow ones? Yeah. Oh yeah, with yellow. with the with the black dots. But he black would make dots. these, like, um, just like these big like statements yes, and then statements. and then they just became like these parts and then he would go away and he would come back to it and then and it was like he was the first guy that i, I kind of ever listened to where i heard like a music like a section yeah like it wasn't just some guy yeah. doing all that type of stuff this one this is one video but i swear to god it's almost like he's like giving you a drum lesson as he's playing a solo where he just starts the solo on the snare and the whole thing is he's just on the snare and then all of a sudden he starts adding the high rack tone Right. And he incorporates that. And then it's the top two. And then it's the top. And, you know, it's the three, four times. And by the end, the whole kit comes alive. And then he's just, and it's still just the drums. Yeah. And then he starts doing something with his foot, splashing the things. And then he's up. Oh, yeah. And it's like, this is like, it was a masterpiece. And it was almost like he was going like, hey, this is how I learned how to play drums. I started with the snare. Yeah. I got the rudiments yeah. together, blah, blah, blah. And then I added some color over here and I did that. And then by the end of it, he, he was, he just was, um, in command of the whole fucking thing. And he, and he's also like, um, another one of my dr drum teachers, uh, Dave Elich was telling me, he goes, watch him oh, here. Dave Elich. Yeah. He was a great teacher. Oh my God. He's the best. So you, he goes, he goes, you got, he goes, watch this, watch this, watch what he does here. And he like plays like this, um, you know, this figure on the snare and he was mimicking with one bass drum. Yeah. And he did it like three times. And like the third time he did it, he, he kind of, he kind of ate shit on it. And he literally goes like, he's like, and just kept going. And it's just like, he showed, he, he, no, but as a comedian, he, I'm just like, that's what it is. I bombed on that one. I'm going to keep going. I'll try that again tomorrow night. And I'll have it down. Yeah. It's like, yeah, did. you know, I fucking tried that, it. It didn't work. Guy was a freakazoid. Yeah. It, um, I mean, that guy, he could, what a shame. Yeah. It was, what a sh it was unnecessary. Yeah. It was, Somebody messed up. A nurse messed up. Yeah. He had like gallbladder surgery. Yeah. And he shouldn't die from that. Yeah. And he said, something, oh, he had a something, heart attack. Like something went, something went wrong. They, they just, they met them. The word is they messed it up. I mean, it's really too bad. Cause Out of you, every, you know, if you're going to mess up, like, why do they mess up on that guy? Yeah. You know what I mean? I know there's a couple of people we'd love to mess up on, but, yeah. you know, I, I, <laughs> I was avoiding that side of it, but I know what you mean. I said, they're going to bleep this one out. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I There's ran no into reason. him once. I was doing um, a session, mm -hmm. a Patty Smythe session that became real big uh, album. And then on the weekends, I was up in uh, San Francisco doing, um, Chris Isaac. And you know, this is like, I had, you know, I had drums in New York, Nashville, LA, Indiana, of course, where I lived, Japan, Germany. People would fly me all over the place because people were selling albums. I mean, I got a couple albums here that sold 40 million and, they, and, the, and the record label's making 85 cents on the dollar. So, I mean, think about it, do the math. So anyway, I come down, I'm in a baggage claim, I see, you know, this Afro-American guy with a zillion jacket on. Oh, come on. He's got a big, tall, blonde uh, girlfriend. And then I start looking closer, and I knew that Tony had a tall, blonde girlfriend. He was probably on the same plane I was on, because I, I went from San Francisco. Hair was the same color as his kit. <laughs> <laughs> it's like canary yellow. So I go up, and I went, oh, my God, it's Tony. Before I could say anything, he goes, hey, Kenny. I'm like, right. I'm like faint almost. He goes, hey, hey, man, what's up, man? He says, you know, I hear you uh, do a lot of sessions in Nashville. 
And I said, yeah, I do. He says, man, I'd like to do that, man. Tell them I, I'm a pretty good drummer. I can do, I'd like to come down and do some sessions. First of all, I'm going, pretty good drummer. <laughs> and you're going to take all my work. You mean the wet, the best? But then I also knew, dude, you you don't want to go to Nashville. Nashville isn't, you're doing sessions in Nashville isn't a Tony Williams thing. Tony's so creative. You don't plug him in and say, just do this beat for the whole for the whole song, and then... Yeah, something the kids can dance to, 120 BPMs. Yeah, and, and, and <laughs> I'm with, listen, let me tell you something. I, did, I was doing a big session down there, and um, um, we were getting sounds. It was all the A-team people. And all of a sudden, the producer goes, hey, let's make this radio friendly. And I'm like, boy, who are they talking to? Some sucker's getting his butt chewed out. I look over the bass player and says, it's you. I was hitting this, you know, I hit the rim every time I hit the... The snare room, I always hit the, the rim and then the head at the same time, bam. And he, uh, I was hitting the drum a little too hard for radio. A little too much excitement. He couldn't just bring the level down a little bit? That's what, that's what Michael Rhodes claimed was the issue, was that, I think it's you, dude. So, and I remember going- Why wouldn't he just say that to you instead of like, oh. Hey, one of you guys is fucking up out there. <laughs> What? See if you can figure it out. Yeah, it went scrambling. But the thing is, is that, oh, man, the, the musicianship is incredible there. But what was happening was, like, if something's working, they just don't want to, like, budge out of that. That's what's, that drum fill is the fill on the ra radio right now. It's the happening fill. So I swear, man, I was, I, I recorded for a month down there. I, I swore I'd, I'd, I'd played the same song for the whole month with different artists every day. They just... I'm not trying to put Nashville down, but they're trying to sell records. No, it's a business. It's it's a business. They wanted it. So Tony going down there, I was like, oh, man, the, you, you, you'll you freak. You'll go, how about this? They're going, what? No. We just want do 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 ga Let's try to raise their musical intelligence with this one. Is this like so when he said that, that's when my head was going through. No, I, dude, I'll, I'll definitely tell them. But I, I don't want to put, I, I wouldn't want to get you in that spot. You know what I mean? That's why I think the amazing thing about Vinny Caliuta is oh, dude. he can do Every, either. Yeah. He can do either. And it's just, oh, you want something simple? All right. And then like. And loves it. Yeah. He loves it. That's, you can hear, he owns it. Mm -hmm. He owns it. He can lay it down. Oh, you know, I talked to him one time about this album and he freaked out saying how much he loved it. And it was. Uh, something he recorded? No. It was the, um, uh, who's, oh God, what's his name? Uh, Something you wouldn't expect. Dream Dreamweaver guy. Oh yeah, I've played with that guy. Oh, what what what? what? Dreamweaver. That um, fucking album. Yeah. Not that song. Yeah. That album. I, th I don't know the drum. I think it's Alan White. I don't know who it is, but dude, that album. The drums on that album. Uh, I'm uh, space his name. I played with him. I you, can't find a. Ju I, I can't find a judge. Real good songwriter. Da, 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 da. And uh. Da, da, yeah, we're just two old guys now. David, there. Chris, Tom. <laughs> Mike, what was a popular name back then? Wright. His last name was Wright. Wright. Gary Wright. Gary Wright. Gary Wright. Yeah, there you the go. dude. Yeah, between so the two of us, we were I can't remember if it was Alan something or other or Alan White. Maybe the the was it? Alan, I can't remember because that he was like a studio fucking guy. That's a guy. That's a guy who played with Lennon. He was in New York and he was an incredible musician. Sadly, he's dead now. He probably was the drummer on that. Remember that? Yeah. Yeah. That. And then they, and then it goes into the uh, really the simple, rip. but like, but the groove on that that album grew so fucking hard. Yeah, and I because you know Vinny likes stand up. I got to know him through that, and uh, he came out one night. I asked him. I said, "You know what I've been listening to? I was kind of you ever listen to Dream Dreamweaver that that album?" And he goes, "He goes, I fucking love that album." He goes, "I was at Berkeley when that came out, or whatever." And he just really, and I was just, and that's when I was thinking like, I just thought the guy only listened to like yeah, Tony and all Tony of them, was. and it's just like he him appreciating that all of a sudden it just connected like oh that's why this guy's can like blow away drummers yeah. minds blow their minds but he can also yeah just play on like a cheryl crow track yeah and, and fuck blow them. that away yeah too. yeah well you know it comes under the thing you were saying about you know a great athlete a great drummer is a great drummer or a, a drummer like Vinny or will appreciate great music no matter what it is you know, another big one for me is uh, Steve Jordan. Oh, yeah. Steve Jordan's another big one. Dude, uh, and he uh, can play anything. I know. And uh, 
St- Steve Gadd. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All Dude. All right, I got some. Liberty DeVito. Yeah. I just saw Billy Joel, and, and, and he's got a great drummer, and he's got a killer yeah, band. but that's not Liberty. But I, I loved, uh, like, and when you were coming up, and Liberty was already, I, like, you guys, I was like. Muscle drummers. Yeah, but I was like, these guys. No, but I just felt like both of you guys, when I watched you, were, like, having the time of your life. Yeah. And I was like, this is, and so, like, um, I went to go see, uh, uh, when you were playing with John, I went to go see him, not because of, you know, John Mellencamp. I went to see you. And what, I saw we, you, I saw you at, it was Worcester? Great Woods in Great Mansfield, Woods. Massachusetts, which is where I also saw Eddie Murphy on the Raw tour. And I saw you and you were playing and you were putting your hand yeah, up and coming up. down. But dude, I had lawn seats and that little move there. Got your attention? It pulled me into the show. Well, you it's know like what? this guy, Yeah, I felt like this guy gives a shit that I'm way out there. And he's, he's like, you know, hey man, I, I see you back there. I used Instead to play of just sitting there smiling yeah. at the, all the hotties that get it down. I used to play to the the back of the uh, audience all the time. Yeah. You, then I got you. You know, the, the way I originally came up with that was we were all hung over one day, and I knew John was going to unleash hell on us because John didn't drink. He didn't do nothing. So we were all hung out. You know, we were flying around private jets being rock stars. We were hung over, and I thought, God, I got to get these guys going. So I started playing left hand on the hi-hat and slamming with my right hand to wake everybody up. And then it became a thing. <laughs> and then, and Don't obviously you, yeah, yeah you, uh, and the music was simple enough so I could do it, you know? It's pretty impressive to do that in front of all those people. Yeah. I remember thinking, I'm going to look, I'm going to get that guy way up there. He's waving. That was oh, me. I see you. I see you. That was me. Your head's yeah. big. <laughs> <laughs> that was me. Oh, well, you probably could see my big head. So what, are we... Yeah, he's yeah, they doing start. the wrap it up thing. You want to wrap it up? So oh, I was going to ask you. I was going to ask you so many cool things. I was going to ask. We can do it next time. Yeah. Morgan. And also, I, I already got to see your kit and I got to hear you play it. So that was good enough for me. All right. Well, man. From lawn seats to sitting across from me and watching you play, that's pretty sick. God, who would have thought, right? Not I me. I mean, when you were like, I mean, you thought you were going to be a drummer. Then you got into comedy. I, I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't know what I wanted to do. All I knew was I, I didn't like a nine to five job oh, yeah. unless yeah. there was an element of freedom to it. Like I loved warehousing because I was walking around. Um, I liked uh, grunt work. You could always go back to warehouse. Uh-huh. I mean, it's probably there Can for you. you. Well, now it's just Amazon. There's just one warehouse left. and I They just that... fired 10,000 people. So you, I was going to say, I don't think job. that they, uh, they don't treat you too well. <laughs> That's what I heard. <laughs> but I mean, They're the thing is. Drive that truck all night long. Either, you know what? Comedy or drum, drumming, it's all just massive, massive hard work. It's just, it's just, it's like I got a thing. Drums frustrate me, comedy doesn't. Oh, there you go. It doesn't. Like, comedy to me has always, I mean, there's been frustrating moments, but I don't feel like I'm working uh, when I do stand up. But if I ever sit in with the band, only until I finally now wow. can sit in and not give a fuck and have like a good time. Good time. Yeah, and also kind of let go of, like, I don't have to play it as exactly like the record or whatever. I just right. need to make sure when one comes around, I'm on it so I don't make the whole thing go off the rails, which still happens every once in a while. Do you, I mean, is it hard for you to memorize? Like, for, like I, I do inspirational speaking. I have an hour show, and now I'm finally to the point after eight years where, you know, I memorize it, but I'm, gotten, I'm to the point where I know the material so well, I kind of move around. If I skip something, I don't worry about where I used to go, oh, my God, I got off the rails. And then everybody can see that I'm like, you know, where now it's like, I feel the power of moving around. That's cool, man. hundred percent. And I learned, I became a better drummer when I got, became a better comedian because it, it all, it 100% translates yeah. one or the other. It's just, you're doing something different where it's like, um, where I go out on stage and like, I, I'm not thinking about anything. I'm not even thinking about what I'm going to, like if I'm, you know, firing it on all, all cylinders or whatever. Like, I'm not thinking about anything. I just walk out and start talking. And then that leads me, I know what my act is, yeah. but it's almost like a game of how little of my act can I do and then how much can I just hang out and make you guys laugh. And then I kind of realized with like, with like drums, how locked in I was. And uh, the stand-up version of that is when you're trapped in your act and you're like, yeah. I do this joke and then yeah, I do that. Yeah, yeah, and I yeah. look over here and then you're afraid to try. That, like I see guys like 
you know, go through periods of like, you just get like trapped in your act. And like, I went through that where like, I would have like writer's block and shit like that. And I learned these games to play with my mind to free me up. And so then I created like little exercises that I'm just doing now after all these years of playing that are starting to free me up where it's getting closer to hearing it and then playing it. I still have to stop and kind of sing it, and da, 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 you know, but it's like this, like the freedom you have as a comic, it's so much easier to get free as a comedian where it's cause you're already speaking. And you buy yourself so, but, but I'm trying yeah, to, but I'm, I'm trying to be, you know, you talk all day long. So you're jamming the whole time. The thing that blows me away about what you guys do is you learn how to speak through an instrument. So it's like, you have to learn how to talk again. Yeah. And then when you like the most exciting thing for me as a music fan is to watch a band. Um, and you know that like they have a structure, but it's real loose and you see them looking and smiling at each yeah. other and look th and then it just feels alive. And, uh, like I'm seeing, a, um, I'm spending an extra day in New York and I'm going to the show at the blue note. This kid, uh, I hope you say his name, right? You said, you said Dave, Dave's or something oh. like that. Um, Is he new, new artist? Or? Yeah. It's fucking incredible. Uh, um, another drummer buddy of mine yeah. goes, you got to check this kid out. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. I can't believe I can't believe I didn't say his name right. I'm old. I don't know who anybody is, but I but I just listened to the album and it was like his drumming. Is it jazz? I don't know what to call it. Oh wow! I'll play but it for improvisation you. Improvisation. It, yeah, it's like uh, it, there's improv vibe. Like there's not lyrics or anything like that. But I wouldn't really call it instrumental music. It's just fucking cool. Yeah. And you're listening to it, and you're listening to what everybody's saying on the album to each other, and yeah. and it's like. Um, I, I would love to see that live. I want to see how Yeah, that... because it's going to be different every night. Those guys live in that world. You yeah, and then it'll inspire me as a comic. Like, I, I know I'm going to go to that show and then think like, you know, I've been a pussy on stage lately. I should fucking take yeah. more chances like like these guys yeah, are, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah, You know, it's all the same thing. You just, you, you it, it's, it's knowing your instrument and being able to go into flow and improvising after you've got all this skill and you are the one that traps yourself and you're the one that makes yourself uptight up there. Which is funny because the balls it takes to do stand up, you'd think that you then wouldn't be, have any fear, but it's like you, you then your act becomes like this safety blanket. It's like, I don't want to go back to bombing. Yeah. I don't want to go back to bombing. I don't want to take up too much of your time here, but. All right, man. Uh, awesome. I had a great time. Always good to see you. Love your new kit. Thanks yeah. for having me. Yeah, well, if we start the white stripes, Am I the drummer or are you the drummer? I don't know. I can't You don't want to start anything musically with me. <laughs> <laughs> you heard me play. <laughs> no, you were fine. You were great. Yeah, for a dad. I was, I'm not bad for a dad. Yeah, for a dad. Yeah. Oh my God. Listen, one of the worst things you can do is give somebody false hope. Don't do that to me.